Tonight, an alleged assault on a driver captured on camera, but who's responsible for safety, the ride-sharing company or the cops? There is really not a whole lot you can do when you're strapped into the front seat of a car except sit there and hope it doesn't escalate. This Uber driver won't be stopping at George Street anytime soon. He says police aren't offering proper protection for those behind the wheel. Goose Bay is a dangerous place to live. Goose Bay is a very dangerous place. Hundreds of angry residents in central Labrador want police to act and crack down on crime in the community. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Peter Cowan. A St. John's Uber driver says he's hitting a roadblock after he says a passenger assaulted him on the job. Gary Noftel is frustrated with police about the lack of progress being made in his case. Here now's Heather Gillis reports. Uber driver Gary Noftel says this passenger allegedly assaulted him. You f***ed me by going the wrong way and you decided you wanted car. to be a f***ing arrogant Get out. It happened early on a Saturday morning in late June. Noftel picked up the man at a McDonald's on Topsail Road, destined for the downtown. He says he was following a route the Uber app told him to take, but the passenger was agitated, unhappy with the choice. He was at every single... Uh, light, he would get visibly upset and, you know, he would exclaim that I was uh, 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 taking too much time and this was the wrong route and this is so bad, I'm going to be late. When they arrived at the man's destination, George Street, things blew up. Noftel filed a police report armed with the passenger's first name from the app and the whole incident captured on a dash cam, clearly featuring the passenger's face. Noftel thought the case would be a slam dunk for the police. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary opened an investigation, but Noftel says there's been a roadblock. He says Uber houses its data in the United States. Police told him they'd need a court order to get the passenger's full name and other information from his account. He says because of that, the RNC believed a judge would throw the case out. Noftel isn't buying it. Well, I'm not sure that that passes the sniff test because, you know, uh, jurisdictions exchange information all of the time. I don't see why uh, the RNC shouldn't be able to uh, ask for a court order and issue it to uh, uh, Uber Canada, who will thereupon get the information off the servers. Meanwhile, Uber says it takes reports of violence seriously and is investigating. In a statement, the ride-hailing company says, we have a team dedicated to supporting law enforcement investigations through a valid legal process. They've reached out to police in this case to offer assistance with the request process. Uber also says it has tons of safety features in its app, like emergency buttons, audio recording, and GPS tracking. It also has an online portal where law enforcement agencies can access information legally. Noftel says he's still driving for Uber, but won't be taking people back and forth to the George Street Bar District anymore. Meanwhile, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary says it won't comment on the case because it's still actively investigating. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Now, Uber's safety team called Noftel this afternoon. They told him they have the passenger's information ready for the police, but the company says it has not heard from the RNC. Well, there was anger on the streets of Happy Valley Goose Bay last night as people spoke out about the pervasive crime in their community. On Saturday, the Sandbar Lounge was destroyed and it's believed to be arson. But people living in the community say violence and lawlessness is an everyday part of life and police seem powerless to stop it. This is not just about the sandbar. Goose Bay is a dangerous place to live. Goose Bay is a very dangerous place. Talking about the RCMP, with all due respect, because I do respect and appreciate the RCMP more than what this is going to sound like today. But I want everybody here to know that I have begged for years for more RCMP presence at my yes, bar. Yes. To do walkthroughs, to stop the drugs, to remove the people yes. who aren't allowed in. I have begged for help. Where yes. is the help? We're a community in crisis. This gentleman is holding the right sign. Our kids can't use the bike trails. Our kids can't walk to Tim's or wherever. Our seniors are being accosted. 
We've got families losing their businesses. We've got other businesses that are being impacted. And we are sick of dealing with this issue. As a, and whether you feel that it's useless or not, because the, what I'm hearing is that the numbers at the RCMP statistic-wise are not increasing. Bullshit. So what I'm saying to you is what I've said all along, make sure you call. Make sure, make sure you call. My husband because watched a, a man get beat over the head with a big stick. We got it on video and called the cops, and they didn't show up behind his work. Do you have the date and the time? Yes, we then do, and we got it on video. Someone broke in my house one night. I was in bed. Left me up. Mom gave me a heart attack. No. Now I took him to court. Just as his son dropped the trespassing charges. Exactly. So anyone who's in, been impacted, whether it's your property, whether it's your grandchildren, whether it's your own home, whether it's your business, whether it's your car, that's been impacted by this issue, I want you to raise your hand. And I want CBC to do a thing around. What are we going to do today to prevent the crime in Goose Bay? How are we going to protect the citizens of our community? Does somebody else have to die? Do we have to bring up the unsolved murders in this town? Our community is not safe. We need to band together. This is not okay. Premier Fury, Justin Trudeau, whoever's going to listen yes. to us, we are in crisis. We are not yes. safe here. Yes. Yeah. 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 Meanwhile, the RCMP says numbers don't show any increase in reported crimes over the last few years in Happy Valley Goose Bay, but they say that doesn't mean it's not happening. Our officers will respond to all reports of crime and investigate and lay charges when that is supported by evidence and witness statements. Um, what we believe is that people are not making those reports, so they may be um, you know, posting on their own social media account about a crime that they've seen or that they've heard of, uh, but that's not a police report. That doesn't get to our officers and that doesn't get to an investigation stage and it certainly doesn't make our numbers to show crime trends. Well, it was an emotional homecoming for elders in northern Labrador. About 40 people who were forced out of their homes in Newtak and Hebron in the 1950s and relocated south had the opportunity to return their to their communities last month. For some, that brought closure. The CBC's Samuel Watt reports. On board these Royal Canadian Navy ships, these elders are headed for the place they once called home, some for the first time since they were evicted as children. It's been a very healing journey for people and um, really bringing out the, the childhood in, in people. Lena or Nalik's grandparents were displaced from Hebron, so organising this trip was personal. One thing that my uh, grandparents um, never talked about with me personally was the hurt. Uh, they didn't delve into detail about it. Um, they just talked about how Mokovic was their home now. Around seven and a half thousand people were relocated from Newtuck and Hebron in the late 50s without consultation. A logistical move for the provincial government to consolidate those northern communities, but a painful loss for the Inuit way of life. For years, Sarah Townley's parents didn't talk about that loss. She was just three months old when she was pushed out of Hebron. She's been back several times since, but every time she discovers something new. I used to hear place names. I started going to those places. I started realizing how beautiful and vast and um, so much wildlife that us there. The reunion by the new Nazi Avut government was made possible with funding from the Arctic Inspiration Prize and the Royal Canadian Navy who offered the ships. Sabrina Nash is the strategic planning advisor there. Her biggest takeaway from that journey to New Tuck. Just the resilience of, of, uh, of those families and of the people and being forced into situations that was not their decision. Joining this reunion was a decision these elders chose to make as a step towards letting go of the past. Samuel Watt, CBC News, Yikaluit.
It's a celebration of culture and community on Labrador's North Coast, one organizers say is more important than ever. Here now's Heidi Adder takes us to Salmon Fest in Rigolet. Along the shores of Lake Melville, the population of this tiny town swells each August. It's about bringing people home and a whole Newfoundland Labrador to get the taste of what we love about our community. It's about what's unique about Rigolet Inuit community government and Rigolet community than any other community within Nunatsiavo. The festival is run by the local government and volunteers start planning in April. This year, the community is celebrating Christmas in August with an opening parade and costumes leading into a full day of traditional square dances, a cakewalk, and a northern version of a local favorite game show, The Price is Right. Hello, everybody! Martin Shaiwa, come on down! Elsie, you need to get um, 12.50. The festival also showcases traditional practices, including drumming by Rigolet's own Brooklyn Wolfrey. And traditional temporary tattoos done by a local artist. There's a positive reaction, but there it took a little bit of courage for people to come and actually get them done. But now that people are actually coming and getting their face done and their wrists done, they're, they're very, wearing them very proudly, and I'm very proud of that. I think it's very important because it was something that was stripped away from us a very, very long time ago. Now that people know that it's okay to wear them, like people will do it if they see somebody else doing it, so it's just taking that first step, I think. Organizers are overjoyed to watch people passing on traditional knowledge and dance to the next generation. It's about mm -hmm. your grandmother and your grandfathers and their families bringing in the culture that we have here and keeping it alive. And when we see an elder with a youth and a child, it's, it's just close the heart that they'll, they're getting taught by the ones that who taught us. These days, on top of bringing people back home, the festival is also drawing some tourists to the town. Located on the edge of the Mealy Mountains National Park Reserve, the area is becoming more of an attraction to people outside of the region. Organizers hope the draw of a national park and the chance to experience Rigolette's traditions will bring in more people from outside the region next year. There's no other place like Rigolette. And we're proud of who we are and what we are. This is one spot you got to stop into. This is the place. But the festival is about more than just tourism potential. It ends with dinner and a dance, and nearly half of the town's population crammed into the community hall. We, we do love our community, but a lot of times we have to show our own community that we have so much potential. We don't need a multi-million dollar industry to promote who we are. We just want you to come see who we are. Since COVID, the world changed. People feel lonely. And for us to come together into a community hall and have traditional food and have lots of fun and entertainment, that's what it's all about. Heidi Adder, CBC News, Rigolette, Labrador. Every year, thousands of people hike part of the East Coast Trail. Most, though, don't hike the whole 300 kilometers all in one go. But that's exactly what Neve Sullivan is doing beginning today. It's all to raise money for mental health research after her own experience with the system earlier this year. And just a warning before we show it to you, this story contains discussion of suicide. My name is Neve Sullivan. I'm 20 years old. Uh, I'm about to hike the entire East Coast Trail over the next 18 days for, to raise money for uh, the Center for Mental Health and Addictions. I've got into hiking a couple of years ago when I moved back to St. John's from Toronto. Um, but I attempted suicide in March of this year, uh, breaking my spine and ankle. And just going through that made me realize how terrible the healthcare system is here, let alone like mental health, not even just here, like the entire country. Like I know we're building a new facility and that's great, but I feel like it's been in progress for a long time. And I, just, I feel like we haven't gotten any updates when it's going to be done. Um, but the psychiatric hospital that we've got now, the Waterford, um, at least the adult psychiatric hospital, uh, I was there and the, like I could compare the inside to a prison. Um, and when I, at one point when I was there, I was 
taken to the ground by two uh, large male security guards sedated and locked in a room and I don't even know how long I was in there and that's kind of how that went. Uh, no referral to a psychiatrist uh, outside of the hospital, no medication changes, like honestly, like nothing. But it would be really awesome to see more accessibility to family doctors um, because uh, it's it's hard when you like have to go to the emergency room just to see somebody because you're waiting for hours on end. Um, I would absolutely like to see that mental health facility up and running. I think that could be something really great. Um, and honestly, just like better treatment of patients. Like there's a lot of things we can do, and I think just not only raising money but raising awareness is like bringing people together to try and improve what we already have. I'm confident that I will make it to Kappa Hayden in one piece, uh, but I, I absolutely I think there's going to be hard days. But uh, just gotta remember what I'm like doing this for, and it, it will be worth it in a couple of weeks. If you or someone you know is struggling, here's where you can get help. Canada's Suicide Crisis Helpline. You can call or text 988. There's also the Kids Help Phone. You can call 1-800-668-6868 or text 686868. You can also access live counselling chat on the Kids Help Phone website. Scattered showers will clear overnight and into early Wednesday, then... High pressure taking over for a couple of days with some cooler temperatures. Your full forecast is coming up.
Time for a check of your weather forecast. Ryan Snodden in for Ashley this evening. Always great to be here and have a look at our highs today. You can see yeah, just 15 in through central parts of the island today. 22 in St. John's, the warmest temps along the south coast and noticeably cooler here along the north coast where again we are looking at the other side of this frontal boundary. It's where we're looking at these northerly winds ushering in that much cooler, fresher air mass so over the next couple of days. This high will sit in and clear the skies, but we do have to wait until this front completely moves out. And we can say goodbye to those showers, which uh, will continue at least through this evening, edging into the overnight hours, especially along uh, the south coast, the Buren Peninsula, southern Avalon, uh, and even towards the metro area as well. Note temperatures dropping into the mid single digits in Grand Falls, Windsor, the Badger region. Uh, looks like we'll be, yeah, eights across the board from the Northern Peninsula up into the North Coast, uh, near double digits uh, for Saint, uh, for uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, excuse me. Now, note as we roll through the overnight, there goes that front moving out. By the time we get to tomorrow afternoon, We've cleared out quite nicely, but the Avalon Peninsula will kind of be the last to clear out throughout the day tomorrow. Some lingering light drizzle, light shower activity possible in those northeasterly winds. And those northeasterly winds are going to make their presence felt with the temperatures pretty much right around 15 degrees. We may squeak up a little bit warmer than that for inland parts of the Avalon tomorrow and down towards Argentia, Placentia, and certainly down towards the Buren Peninsula, Port of Mass near 19. Best chance of 20 will be Grand Falls, Windsor, back through the Deer Lake, Humber Valley region towards Cornerbrook. And Labrador looks fantastic tomorrow. Temperatures nicely into the mid 20s. So this high will continue to dominate as we work our way through Wednesday night and into Thursday. And that's going to keep any precipitation at bay, not only off to the southeast, but also to the west. So the island looks good. We'll start to see some shower chances creeping in to Happy Valley Goose Bay uh, and up towards the Cartwright region, though it looks like at this point a very isolated risk. 30% or so. Same thing through Labrador City. So uh, certainly the clouds going to be in the mix, but uh, those uh, shower chances will be few and far between. But certainly there uh, we are going to be looking at temperatures across the island. Once again, kind of high teens, low 20s for most and a pretty pleasant day uh, with a mix of sun and cloud. Thanks to that area of high pressure, which will then continue to dominate even as we move into the Friday time period for the island. So another nice one shaping up there with some showers starting to become a little more prevalent as we turn the page into Labrador. This is our next system that we're going to have to keep an eye on in the tropical Atlantic tropical storm Ernesto. And yes, uh, that will continue to work its way northward over the next few days. Days, uh, you can see making that turn to the north throughout late Wednesday into Thursday. When it turns north, that is obviously going to be a key component to the forecast. Pretty good agreement right now that it will turn north and then impact Bermuda as we roll into the weekend. So keeping an eye on that part of the forecast, then it's expected to continue to move to the north throughout the weekend. This is as far as the official National Hurricane Center cone goes, but I can show you a little glimpse into the future with some of the forecast model projections. And you can see here some pretty tight clustering as it works its way up into at least Atlantic Canadian waters. Now, whether it's you know on this side of the track or this side of the track still remains to be seen. Early next week, that's when we're going to have to really start keeping our eye on things. So stay tuned for updates. So uh, too early to say whether uh, it will impact us for sure and certainly way too early to say how it would impact us if it does. You can see nice stretch Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We'll focus on that in the short term and you can see those showers starting to roll their way into the forecast for Sunday uh, with a risk uh, edging into St. John's and the east central Newfoundland. Nice stretch right through the next five days. Note temperatures warming up here back up into the mid 20s Friday into Saturday. Nice weekend shaping up in central. Uh, we are looking at western Newfoundland as well. A nice looking forecast here. And as we move into uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, eastern parts of Labrador, shower chances on the increase through the Friday into Saturday and certainly Sunday time period. And for Labrador City Wabash, we are looking at those uh, showers starting to squeak in for Saturday, Sunday, and much cooler on the other side of that frontal boundary that will be moving through the region. That is your forecast now. Peter, back to you. Thanks, Ryan. I want to share a quick video with you of a close encounter near Fogo Island. Take a look. Oh my God. Aww. You're scary. <laughs> <laughs>
Andrea Sargent says this was the most amazing experience of her life. A right whale swang right up to their boat before diving down and coming up again. You can't get much more up close and personal with that. For various reasons, divorce, separation, child custody hearings, more people are finding themselves in front of a judge and in family court. And here in Atlantic Canada, more and more people are doing it on their own. The CBC's Cody McKay explains why that is. At some point in your life, you may find yourself here at court dealing with a family matter. It could have to do with a divorce or a separation, a child custody negotiation. More and more Canadians are finding themselves in these courtrooms and right there in front of a judge, but without a lawyer to represent them. What we hear from, from family court is that um, well over half of parties in, in family court matters uh, of litigants represent themselves. Commonly, we see clients who can't afford to hire a lawyer 
and are choosing to self-represent in a court situation, which is very, very challenging. There are several reasons why it's gotten to this point, and affordability is a big one. People can't afford gas, rent, groceries, basic necessities, so lawyers are out of reach. According to Legal Info Nova Scotia, hourly rates for lawyers range from $150 to $500 per hour. So more Atlantic Canadians are relying on things like legal aid to get representation. But... Some people may even be discouraged to apply for legal aid thinking, well, there's, uh, it's going to take too long. Uh, so they don't even call. But yes, they are very swamped uh, from what I've heard. Wh whether you're an HRM in, in the Halifax Dartmouth or you're in the more rural communities, you're always going to have to wait a good couple of months. So even if people can afford it, access overall to lawyers across Atlantic Canada is tight. Take this report from 2013 by the Action Committee on Access to Justice in Civil and Family Matters. It noted serious concerns around access. Now, fast forward to 2020, former Chief Justice of Canada Beverly McLaughlin said access to justice in civil and family matters was then at a crisis in Canada. To make matters even worse, there are factors outside of a client's control, even if they have the money and can afford a family lawyer. We certainly have clients who have the means to hire a lawyer and they have to go off island to find a lawyer who can address their needs. It just adds a layer of complexity and cost and travel expense and um, extra confusion and stress in, in a moment in people's lives it's already confusing, expensive, time consuming and stressful. People living in rural areas of Atlantic Canada are having a harder time finding lawyers to take them on. And as cities get bigger, so do the law firms. And when law firms get bigger, that means conflict of interest becomes much more common. So there's a push towards larger law firms, but that means that it's the law firm that's conflicted. If I represent um, a parent in a matter, then that means that the opposing side is conflicted out from the entire office. So it's much more likely you're going to have to hire a lawyer from somewhere else, which circles back to problems around access and affordability. Well, in New Brunswick, those problems are obvious. Family lawyers are backed up. All of the family lawyers are just up to capacity. They're swamped. You know, many of them are actually over, they're doing their best. What they're saying to people is not, you know, I don't care or this isn't worth it financially or whatever. A lot of what they're saying is we do not have time. We do not have the staffing to be able to serve you and advance your case in a timely way. That's leading people to represent themselves in court, which is hard on everyone in the system. So what's the answer? Well, experts say that legal aid in the Atlantic provinces needs more resources, it needs more lawyers, and the provinces need to open up who qualifies for legal aid. They also need to hire more judges to make sure that court backlogs can be cut down. And in a world where more people are self-representing here in court, to have legal education available so people who go it alone don't feel like they're in the dark. Cody McKay, CBC News, Charlottetown. Canada's telecommunications regulator has ordered some large phone companies to give competitors access to their existing fiber internet networks for a fee. The CRTC's ruling is aimed at stimulating competition for internet services. Anise Hidari has the details. Canadians looking for internet service may have a few more choices soon. That is, if the CRTC has its way. The regulator is forcing the big phone companies with fast fiber optic networks to allow competitors to use them. It means the smaller guys don't have to dig up their own lines. This is something that we fought for for years. I'm pretty confident that tech savvy will make fiber services available. The idea that you're gonna have competitive ISPs building up their, their own infrastructure uh, to connect all Canadian homes, that ain't gonna happen. It's not desirable, it's not economic. The goal is more players in the market, but whether that lowers prices depends on how much the CRTC lets the big companies charge for sharing. But it's really hard to say whether it's going to actually translate into more competition until we see those rates, which now we expect by the end of the year. In exchange for being forced to share existing fiber with smaller competitors, the big companies don't have to share anything they build from now on for five years. Well, basically, it's a head start uh, rule uh, that 
gives the incumbents a head start as if they need any more uh, incentives and favors. As for what those incumbents think, Bell and Telus didn't get back to CBC News, and the Canadian Telecommunications Association, which represents the big companies, said it didn't have a comment at this time. But the last time the CRTC made a similar move, Bell threatened to cut back on investing in fiber optics. As for when new competitors can start using those networks, the CRTC says it wants to see that by next February. Anis Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. Now, fiber networks owned by cable companies like Rogers Communications in this province are exempt from the expanded mandate because their fiber footprint is relatively small. Members of Parliament's National Security Committee voted today to launch a study into the terror suspects arrested in Ontario last month. The vote was unanimous. The committee will try to determine how a man now facing terror charges was allowed into the country and became a Canadian citizen. Ahmed Fouad Mustafa Aldidi and his adult son Mustafa Aldidi were arrested in a Toronto suburb and face nine terrorism charges. Among those is conspiracy to commit murder on behalf of the Islamic State. Authorities say that at the time of arrest, the men were in advanced stages of planning the attack. They made separate virtual appearances in court today for bail hearings, but proceedings were delayed until Thursday so they could retain lawyers. The Parliamentary Committee will begin proceedings later this month. Immigration Minister Mark Miller and Public Safety Minister Dominic Leblanc will be called to testify. Ontario health officials say a third person in the province has died as the result of a deadly listeria outbreak. The outbreak has been linked to contaminated plant-based milk products. The Public Health Agency of Canada also confirmed that 20 people who consumed Silk brand almond oat and coconut milks and Great Value brand almond milk became sick. 15 cases involved hospitalizations. 13 of the cases have been in Ontario, 5 in Quebec, 1 in Nova Scotia and 1 in Alberta. Fruit growers in British Columbia are scrambling to find places to store and package their crops. It's due to last month's closure of cold storage units operated by BC Fruit, Tree Fruit Cooperative. The head of the Growers Association is calling on the province to step in and acquire the units. Our goal uh, with respect to the co-op is to work with the community to uh, provide as many of those services that the co-op provided so that there's no uh, interruption, that people are supported. Uh, so immediately it's around access to the storage for fruit, uh, for the packing, uh, connecting them with uh, private uh, packers that are able to respond. The BC Tree Fruits Cooperative has now filed for creditor protection. It says extremely low volumes of fruit and difficult market conditions forced it to close. Weather this winter wiped out almost all of BC's peach and apricot and nectarine crops for the year and severely damaged cherry orchards. They had only just begun to recover from the heat dome of 2021 and a harsh winter in 2022. Scientists think there could be an ocean of water deep below the surface of Mars. Three, two, zero. NASA's Mars InSight lander launched in 2018 and has sent information suggesting vast amounts of water could be stored in cracks and fractures in subsurface rocks. Scientists say seismic readings put the water at 10 to 20 kilograms, uh, sorry, kilometers underground. They estimate there could be enough water to cover the entire surface of the red planet. The discovery advances the search for life beyond Earth. It suggests Mars potentially offers conditions favorable to sustain microbial life, either in the past or the present. We are a group of friends and like we, we, uh, we wanted to celebrate it together, the four of us. Our, this is what we believe in and this is our virtue, this is our culture. Here comes the bride and another bride and, and another bride. It's the biggest day of their lives and these couples are sharing it with their closest friends. We'll take you to St. Teresa's Parish for a real wedding party, a mass wedding that's just ahead.
One final look at your forecast this evening. Ryan Snodden again in for Ashley. And you can see the forecast for tomorrow, certainly cooler temperatures, just 15 in the metro area. We can thank the northeast wind for that to 20, gusting 30 to 40. Should ease a little bit into the afternoon, especially across the central parts of the island where the winds will become light and variable. That'll help temperatures popping up to near 20 degrees. Grand Falls, Windsor, back towards Corner Brook. Uh, best chances for cracking 20, but pretty close. Gander, Terra Nova, and certainly in the Labrador, a beautiful day shaping up with uh, temperatures into the mid-20s thanks to this area of high pressure. So there are those showers that will clear away by tomorrow morning for most. The Avalon lingering into the afternoon. That high moves overhead eases the winds. That'll allow the sunshine to really take over into the afternoon. We are looking at a nice day shaping up for Thursday as well across the island. Clouding up in Labrador, but for the most part, just a couple of drops possible, especially towards the Happy Valley Goose Bay area. Shower chances will increase in Labrador on Friday. The island looks good again on Friday and the weekend not shaping up too badly either. That's your, your forecast. And now, Peter, back to you. Thanks, Ryan. Four Filipino couples tied the knot on the same day in one big shared wedding celebration in St. John's. Mass wedding is a popular tradition in the Philippines, but not quite so common around here. The Filipino community came together over the weekend to celebrate not one, but four newlywed couples. Take a look. This is actually officially practiced in the Philippines. We call it as a mass wedding. Although the four of us are actually in the community, the Couples for Christ community, who started this, uh, this program here in Newfoundland in St. John's. And I know that it's also the first time here that happened um, that four couples in one day sweat in, in, like, in this one big occasion. <laughs> so, you know, why was it important for you to be in a mass wedding as opposed to just a single wedding? Um, well, aside from the from the economical <laughs> perspective, um, we are a group of friends, yeah. and like we we uh, we wanted to celebrate it together, yeah. the four of us, and um, so we planned this a year ago, and like uh, we really thought that it won't come to it will not come into life. But then we were so happy with uh, the community itself and our family and friends who are here to witness our, our wedding. We are so happy and grateful that finally it has come. The mass wedding, um, it was just an idea from one of our friends. And we just want, we're, we're just in the same situation where we wanted to have the, not as a traditional life, but as well, this is, our, this is what we believed in. And this is our virtue, this is our culture, and we are practicing it, we believe it, and so we have, for us, we decided to get married as well as the rest of the other couples. Yeah. And mass wedding actually happens because most of the time mass uh, wedding is expensive, right? And most of the people can't afford it, and Philippines is a Catholic-like country. So we really want uh, most of the weddings are done in the church. So that's why the government or the mayors or anyone in the who's sitting uh, sponsors that one so that it's less expensive for the family. It's, so more it's not as uncommon back home. But here it's probably the first time. So. Yes, <laughs> so it like is. Yeah. <laughs> that's why you want to be part of the history. The important here is really to celebrate love, life, and um, it's important as well as to um, really um, receive the sacrament of because um, for us we we do believe that um, having the sacrament of marriage would really um, make your relationship or your marriage last forever. So great to see them all coming together, and. I guess it saves a bit of money, although if you're a guest at the wedding, I guess this means you now need to buy four gifts. But the good news is, rather than going to four different weddings over the course of the summer, you get to do them all right at the same time. Great to see so many couples enjoying their wedding day. And that's it for us at Here and Now for this Tuesday. If you want to watch the show at any time or if there is something that you missed and you want to go back, see it again, you can visit our YouTube page. Just look for CBC Newfoundland and Labrador. We stream all the episodes of Here and Now live there 
and they're archived as well, so you can always go back and catch up on any ones you missed. That's it for us tonight. Have a great evening.